RT is. So this was, um, do you think it happened at the same time? You were involved with one before the other, it just came along, or it has to do with, I mean, art itself, it's sort of like a self-expression, and things would bother you, you're happy about it, you want to change, you maybe can't change in your real life, you can change in your art. How about starting in real life, you know, start making changes and then, you know, getting through ideas and is that the two? Um, yeah, well I guess I grew up in a pretty conservative town in the Hudson Valley and I wasn't too exposed to too much art, but I started noticing, you know, when I was a really little kid, I started noticing like the kids hanging out in the monument in the center of town and they were skateboarding. Right. And and I always I was always drawn to that because it like there were there were a group of people that, that weren't supervised by adults and and they they went and organized themselves and they were they just made their own fun. And I think so it was it was definitely through through skateboarding that I started getting exposed to just all different kinds of illustration, and even even then I didn't really know how it worked. But like even screen print, like you know, screen printed decks. Fucking Neil Blender and Mark Dawes. Yeah, my totally. introduction too. Yeah, Mark Dawes totally. for sure. That's where I started liking like Todd Swank, like mm -hmm. Foundation logo. That's interesting. I didn't know. That. Yeah. So like, that's that's where I, I that was my first introduction to like was sort of like a creative community, and a lot of a lot of the kids that skated were into graffiti, and you know, much like a lot of more, a little more like aestheticized things, and I was because of punk rock and the politics beat and the messages in a lot of the bands that I like, like the Dead Kennedy or the Crass. Like there was there was something that resonated with me in, in that those messages. So I definitely was. I felt like there I had something that I wanted to communicate, and I was a really angry kid. The jocks in my hometown used to call me Anarchy. They'd be walking down the street like, here comes anarchy. <laughs> but then they'd like beat me up and throw me like, against the locker or something. <laughs> right. But, um, but, so, yeah. You're just a young man wanting to change. <laughs> yeah, so at first, yeah, I, you know, I was well taken care of by my family. I didn't, you know, I grew up, like, with, you know, I guess materially secure. But... I definitely saw like I had a lot of problems and frustrations with the world around me, and I always had a really big problem with authority. So, anarchist politics and sort of the like the autonomy of the individual like really really appealed to me, and so I I, I definitely felt like that there was much like we could as human beings like we're so intelligent and have so much like potential. Even as a teenager, I was like. We can do so much better than this, man. So it's so easy to see, right? When, for, especially for a kid, I think it's <laughs> yeah. so easy to see through bullshit. So when you just you see a commercial, you don't understand why adults freaking out because they already living this life, which is a nine to five, what to buy, you know, consumer based life. And then when you're a kid, you care about pretty much everything else but that yeah. you love sport and video games and whatever excites you but not politics or commercials which later on the adults just kind of fade into that it's all a distraction man yeah from that real thing and that. once we could just do the real thing and not to do like imagine you can you could never like don't ever do it's whatever supposedly called art for money ever just do it for a favor or because you want to or for self-expression or something hurts, needs to get out, want to surprise somebody, want to change the look of my apartment or whatever, but not necessarily because someone needs 150 of the same and no attachment, but you know, you got to pay the bills. Well, yeah. yeah, so it's, it was, yeah, I mean. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It, it's just, yeah, I guess like the, the learning about just the materialism in our in our society, like after graduating high school, like what later in high school I you know I discovered like vegetarianism and veganism, and I was like, I uh, that 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 was an aspect that like really politicized me because all of a sudden I was like not wanting to eat 
animal products, so I had to I had to educate myself on just the whole the industry of agribusiness and and how how destructive it was, but also I had some some pretty dogmatic beliefs and responses towards people eating animals and I, I definitely went through a, like a really self-righteous phase um, sure. but um but I, I totally appreciated and valued the like the hardcore community I was a part of those like vegan and straight edge and and also the me just murder yeah and just yeah you did today I, I was in Ethan today <laughs> oh. <laughs> a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. So that video you and I my brain, man, that was disgusting. You and I both know that, that the yeah. only one that stands up is Gorilla Biscuit. Uh, all those other guys. Oh, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> definitely true. But, uh, yeah, so, I've, like, after getting involved in, in a lot of different animal rights campaigns and through skateboarding, like, you know, seeing, like, even some of my friends, maybe, I, for, I forget how they were making them. It might have been, like, some kind of transfer, but, like, we're making their own T-shirts and stuff like that. We, we made our own shirts in high school, and then somehow every school. band figured that out. Like, yeah, <laughs> there's no band too dumb to not to make shirts at some. Point. I made T-shirts and sold them at the hardcore shows at the other after the rock, and I made them in graphic arts classes as a senior in Connecticut. What the band said? When the band the bands were fine because they were straight edge shirts. The bands were rocking them. They were my kind of mostly oh, awesome. do it when it was my friends' bands play. Yeah, like man. it was a really open atmosphere. <laughs> like even like the band, some of the bands would be like, yeah, those are cool, man. Like set up next to us, I'm gonna shit. We're on tour, that's the only way to make money is fucking selling your own shit here. No, it was fun. It's good I'm, stuff. I'm kidding, man. Don't take me too serious. It's true. It's funny though, because I look back on like some of the like the flyers, because I, I kind of save everything. Um, especially paper. I don't know, it's like sort of my fetish objects is, is po like posters and flyers and prints and books. So. But like looking back on on some of those flyers with my friends and like the shirts and stuff that they made, and, like a bunch of stuff they were doing, it's like it's pretty freaking whack, man. They're like the yeah, just the, it's it's pretty bad. <laughs> but it's see, pretty everybody's got to begin somewhere, you know. Yeah. So I had a, a straight edge run for about seven years or something like that, and uh, yeah, I'm coming from the musical. Um, scene as well um, so I, yeah I'm, I, I totally know what, what you're talking about if what folks listening to this don't know what you're talking about is just look up vegan or vegetarian <laughs> hardcore music punk rock and then you'll get there I we were hoping that we don't have to break that down but something like that so, so it was, for us it was more about the skateboarding every day and the only thing that really meant anything was skateboarding and like drinking or any of that stuff was just so irrelevant I don't know, it wasn't like, it was really like an aggro against it type thing. It was just, we just skated every day and that's all that fucking mattered. You know what I mean? Kind of, at least for me. I mean, we weren't like straight edge in your face type fuck with drunk dudes and shit. You know what I mean? Like we'd go to like stupid job parties and wouldn't like fuck with people, we'd hang out. We'd be like, they suck, what's up? But like we weren't like in your face type shit. Well, here's where I more about skateboarding, you know, every day. You gotta yeah. drive everywhere, what are you gonna be drinking beers? <laughs> Your, your, um, when you grow, growing up, your parents don't necessarily uh, try to put you in any team, any tribe, or you don't belong, belong anywhere because of your parents. They don't say your interests will probably be this or that. So they don't pick your friends. What I'm trying to say is whatever you're drawn to, you start making very early on teams. And you say, I'm team straight edge, I'm team hardcore. At some point, like skaters and hardcore that doesn't go well in certain places, and it's a surfer thing, it's too cheesy, hardcore, it's the East Coast, West Coast. Like, people just belong to teams, and at some point, you belong to, like, you know, so many of them, they overlap, but that just starts building personalities and then gets you off, you know, what kind of person you'll be going with. Yeah, they are all connected. And for me, it's like I just I've always kind of gone between the various communities. So it's like I mean I, I would hang out with the straight edge kids one night, and then the next night I was like getting drunk and high with my other friends. So it's yeah I kind of also another reason why like I, I gravitated towards radical politics was that I just didn't really 
I, I mean, I define my I define myself more on how my, how I thought and how I saw the, my perspective on the world and what I wanted the world to be, and I I wanted to seek out groups of like I wanted to seek out people that were accepting of of anyone. So right. it's like, but rather than I was less interested in 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 marginalizing myself into like a, a, a specific group or scene or culture, and wanting to just be a part of humanity <laughs> so yeah well it's all, always you know every bigger system will try to uni unify everything so every, everybody fits everything it's just much easier to control I guess mm. and then once you're not in that it's so much harder and immediately you know what is wrong with this guy how come he doesn't want to do what everybody wants to do and that's how it, yeah that's how it always starts but so I'm, I'm assuming all this is uh, comes through your art. Well, yeah, it, I think well, that's. I guess that's that's what politicized me, and also what the, the kind of. Creative crowd that that, started inspiring me to make things and and encouraged me to. So, um, you know, skateboarders are just. I I feel like they're some, some of the most creative people I knew, and still know, and um, I ended up, living in a. Uh, New Paltz up in the Hudson Valley, and pretty much was just kind of skating every night. But met uh, they have a pr they were they had a really good uh, pre-making pre uh, department up there, and I made some friends with students there because I wasn't I wasn't much of a student I didn't really go to school, and I've always just figured, like sought out people to teach me how to do how to do the things I want to learn. So a friend of mine I had an idea I was like because Watching the town change a bit, we actually there ended up being a Starbucks. I mean, it's the late '90s, so there was a Starbucks coffee that moved into town. Takeover. And and yeah, there was definitely it was definitely a symbol of like a of a of a change, like having like this really really like strong like corporate um, chain coming into town, like. Felt really invasive on like a the fingers reaching. Was there, was there a Dunkin' Donuts before that or <coughs> not at all? There's a Dunkin' Donuts. There's just but it's like I, I think local grew, stuff, my so. town that I grew up in was like that too. So yeah. Full on. So it totally felt invasive, and I was like, I, you know, and the, so it's the late '90s, so I was like, I was like, God, what the fuck is coming next? Like a Gap, like a because Gap is definitely not hasn't been very cool for a long time, and it's still I don't really know if it was ever cool, but like. So what I decided to do, a friend of mine was a printmaker and was, was doing a, she was actually in the master's program then, but um, she, she was like, well, if you want to, if you want to like, I, or I told her this idea, I was like, you know, I want to make these posters and I want to, I want to wheat paste them in the windows of like an empty storefront and I wanted to say like, Gap, coming soon. <laughs> and so, and like, just make it look That's super fun, official. Though. <laughs> and uh, and so she helped me. Like I, <laughs> I designed it. Like got the Gap logo. I freaking got like this sans serif font that's like coming soon in like big bold letters and stuff like that. Backed by popular demand. Yeah. And she had she had like this pastel colored paper that. So like she helped me do this two color, this two color screen print that I then I I took and it was funny because it was like I I. I went and wheat pasted them like the night before I was leaving leaving town on a road trip for a bunch of weeks with, like around the around the states. And I went out like I ran out like wheat pasted them up. And then I like jumped in the tar car and just like left town. But oh. and I had heard that uh, I I heard from some folks a, a couple of days later that that the, there was a guy that, that from the town that was looking to to rent the storefront <laughs> for like his own like a head shop or something stupid. You know, it's like it's the hip like a hippie town up there, but like, so, um, he like showed up the next day and was like, saw all these posters, like, cause I covered, <laughs> I plastered all the windows and it was, like, you know, it was, it, it was kind of the beginning of, of a lot of these sort of, like, uh, like street interventions and like, that then it was called agitprop, like agitator propaganda, which we were referencing like earlier, um, art movements and, but, um, he was like freaked out. Was like, "What the hell is this?" He's like, "I want to rent this place, and suppose that there's a gap on here." So it was actually really like it really messed with like the, the people from the town because they, they they were thinking like, "Well, there's a Starbucks here now. There's a fucking gap coming." God, what the fuck is next? It's just like yeah, like it really confused people. Money from the town, the fucking 
Like here, you, you just increased our like whatever that thing is called, you know, property value thing. Yeah. So, so I like I I definitely I've always wanted to be the use use art in, in that sort of provocative way, like of either 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 instigating people into into kind of opening their opening their eyes to something that's happening, or or just get them to question like their surroundings. So that was my first experience experience was screen screen printing, and then uh, then the, right after that I got like super big into stenciling, and um, and I kind of that that definitely I, that took off for me because I I was actually painting murals. Uh, well, I was in, traveling in Mexico in the in the Zapatista community, so I started going down to Mexico and, and doing volunteer and like solidarity work. Well, what's that like? Huh? What's that like going on in Mexico and doing that work? Well, again, um, like it was incredible going to Mexico. I made I basically in Texas got like one phone number for someone in the first city I was going to, and they were like, "Oh, go look for so and so." And uh, they're like, like you know, just go ask around for him, and you'll find him. Sure enough, like I got that, got there, like, like found this random dude where he was working at a sandwich shop. But, like he happened to be like a friend of friend of friends, and like from there it was just like through him I just like kept on meeting people, and like my network of of friends just like kept on growing. And I brought a skateboard with me because <laughs> um, I kind of always travel with a skateboard, and. It's because it, it's a it's a ticket into meeting people. It's like you go somewhere and you just like you can go skate and like you just you find you the skate spot. You meet the kids. Okay. Eventually, they're like, "Do you need somewhere to stay?" And I was like, "Yeah, please, thank you." <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I'm sorry to uh, jump in real quick. This is so weird when skateboarding became a sport. To I just never thought of it as a sport, even though the buying um, all means this is really hard to do but I would say skateboarding is a lot more like art because it involves so much DIY at least when it, how it started and what it became like yeah probably there's a lot of major companies that you can now say and you can even boo within the industry like the fuck it's became a major corporation however I think of it when I see someone skateboarding I'm not this is not like someone who's getting ready for the Olympics these are usually like kids <laughs> just you know what I mean like it's not I feel like this is a lot more art even what skateboarding is but finding a spot getting together have your community definitely working from the underground from the bottom up not something when you're like alright this is your uh, where you can work out these are your coaches this is what you pay and then four years we're gonna go at the Olympics and then hopefully you get a medal and then you, then you become a coach. It's not like yeah. that. No, it's, it's a lot more a lifestyle. Well, it's such an individual sport. And there's so many different ways to skateboard. You can be like this kind of skateboarder. Like, you and if you skate you're... vert, you can skate manual pads. Like it's such a almost sort of like a DIY thing. That's what I'm saying. You know what it's I mean? Like skateboarding not... is like as you know, and like once you know a skateboarder, like you're like, hey, you got skateboard shoes on. What's your name, bro? You know, usually, or at least back in the day, it was totally like, yeah, it was like immediately yeah. fucking goddamn friends. Yeah, and the, yeah, that's what it was for me. Like, whole hundred percent traveling in Mexico was just I, I was able to like go from place to place and just meet meet people through skateboarding and stuff. And I think, I mean, there is the the nature of of things being commodified and things being like mass marketed, and that's the nature of the just economic business. system that we live in. Yeah. It's like it. it it constantly needs to find things to we sell have money, to people. And then so somehow you got to, people make money, some people have more controls. Yeah. And but then when you get, when it, like on the ground, it's like skateboarding for me, it's, it's, it's about community and self-expression. So it's... Exactly. A lot yeah. more like art for me. I mean, yeah. and there's no rules as far as, yeah, if you want to do and Ollie, this is how you do it, probably the best. But, it, but there's no one... You, you cannot go to the gym when they're like, huh? Got to work on that a little bit. It's like you got to do it yourself, put in your own energy time, have to fall in love with it, have to want it, have to fail a million times. Break your fucking ass. Yeah. But meanwhile, you're... Huh. you're well, if you guys want to talk about skateboarding, I mean, we could keep we could going. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, so, Kevin. Because I'm like, 
Kevin. East Coast skaters versus West Coast skaters? I mean, yeah. yeah we don't know one another. And I, definitely, <laughs> and I definitely don't want to get in that conversation. So, um, <laughs> when, uh, so Kevin, when, um, we can. Or just hold it up a little bit. So, um, mind, you make a lot of stuff for other artists, like Josh and like a lot of people, and you do a lot of, a lot of your own, your own, your own art prints that are like your own design stuff. Um, what, uh, what inspires you? Like what, you know, like day to day or like when you, you have like, what inspires you to like make art or like just in general, you know, off the top of your head? I mean, well, what inspires me that like people inspire me. I mean, and a, a lot of what I, what I do, I guess, is sort of, not that I always want it to be, but like it's somewhat of a reaction to what's happening in the world around me. Um, if it, most, a lot of times it's current events because the, the content of a lot of my work is like uh, well because I started making a lot of it's, it was protest art like that I that I started out with so um, and you were countering what you've seen yeah you were reacting yeah, yeah. and and so like with you know I guess it, after a while it was called culture jamming and then then there was they're in the you know graffiti and street art in the early thousands. It was like people were really really trying to figure out. There was there was a conversation about public space, and especially in a city like New York, where where space is so controlled, and it's so. What are you testing? Just yeah, right. <laughs> but like yeah, because there's what there's like thirty seven thousand fucking police officers in New York, and it's like there's a fucking army, and there's there's since I. I I've been, I, so I grew up in the Hudson Valley, but like I've been coming in, into the city for, and have been like living on and off since, since 2000, and been hanging out in the 90s, coming down and skating and stuff, but like, so it's, it's such a controlled space that like I, when I started doing, like hanging out with graffiti kids and like doing street art and, and stuff, like the, the conversation was so much about what is public space and trying to contest, like trying to like take over public space and it's what the, How old were you when this happened? About Um well I'm thirty five now. <laughs> but the uh like around like twenty years old or something. Um I mean in my teenage years like I was tagging and doing my friends were already No, I'm just early. thinking so you're twenty and you're like, how can I change like how can I make this place more livable, better? <laughs> Like it's weird when I was twenty, I, <laughs> I guess I was, I was not thinking anything were changing. I was thinking about what would I want I want to do or what would be good or. I was also kind of doing whatever was fun too. <laughs> I mean, I was just like skating. I mean, ultimately you do whatever you want to do, yeah. but but skating in a park or a place. And sorry, not trying to bring it back to skating, but that's some <laughs> some sort of that's what it is. You're like, all right, now we're skating here, and then if. I, you know, I probably won't go there and then try to hang, you know, sit there where people are skating. That's, it's sort of like I'm taking over, but I'm not hurting anybody. Just I'm being here right now with my friends, not, and then we're moving on. But that's almost like the very first step. Like, I like it. I like that I have the power that me and my friends are down here, and it's kind of our area. It becomes like with art. If you leave like street art, you, yeah, I know. You're not gonna like it, but like Banksy, let's just throw out like <laughs> this name everybody knows, just so you know what I'm talking about. Like people like uh, you know, so people criticize that obviously. What do you do when it's public thing? Why are you trying to take it over? But you're really not. You're just saying like, hey, I'm also here. So it's if anything, this is will help or make some a positive impact. I'm not. This is not about destroying it. Just I can't go to your house, knock on your door, and then tell you, listen, open your eyes and then do this. <laughs> but I can do that but that's once a, you're on the street, when it's like everybody's down on the street. And that's the aspect of public space, and I think a lot of those conversations were, were confronted with advertising so much that, like, this is supposedly public space, but the, that wall over there is, is per, purchased and bought by, you know, the billboard company, and then they get yeah. to say whatever they want to so. say. For for many years, it was like for me, I was like I was putting up art up, up, out in the street, one to can to try and like to mess around with you know, like my gap my gap post thing was like was was messing like just kind of the subvertising like 
the um, to subvert the advertising, but also because to try and like claim that public space back for us where we can communicate with each other, and that's that we was, don't communicate for a lot of years. Like that was like one of the one of my like big inspirations was like trying to figure out how to participate in that public realm with with other human beings and artists of like of how to have a dialogue. So. Free speech. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's I'd say like for that for a long time I was doing a lot of stuff around that. And then it's I've kind of gone through a lot of different trajectories. You mentioned Banksy. So I was actually in Mexico and doing volunteer work in the autonomous communities of the Zapatistas who actually just had their twentieth anniversary of the uprising in like thirty years of the organization and I was um, doing water projects in the communities and bumped in the guy I was working with. Like, we ended up going to his community. He knew like these all these British dudes. There was a British football team that was traveling around around Mexico, and they uh, because the Mexican visas say like foreigners aren't allowed to get involved in anything political. So these guys, they're this, they're an anti-fascist team from from Bristol, and they um, they figured out they're like a sort of loophole in the visa said that sports teams are allowed to travel and this area of Mexico is actually elite <coughs> excuse me it was a controlled in like a military zone so they um, they figured out this loophole they end up getting a football team like that sports team that are allowed to travel and they're like let's go play play soccer games against the Zapatistas and they're like well why don't we bring our friend Banksy and we, he can paint murals in the communities too because they they got tons of murals so so I end up meeting these guys and and a playing like their last tournament with them and painting, they, and painting a fucking thing with playing yeah soccer? we won yeah I'm me I'm not very good no. <laughs> it's fun though um, it, and as far as like sp like sports like that go it, it, I do appreciate soccer because it is like a sport that all you need is like a fucking round thing to kick around and like you, anybody can play really just for fun so goal but I I had met Banksy there and I was like watching this dude cut stencils and I was like. I can fucking do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that really like drove, drove me to like to make more stencils. He's a real person. Yeah. <laughs> he's pretty fucking. He is real. Too. He has it. <clears throat> but he's also done his thing for like ten to fifteen, ten to twelve years. Oh, he's a So he's that's good. why. I... Anyway. But, oh, whatever, Kevin. Um. So. Yeah. So over the years, it's been a lot of different things that have inspired me. Like the the mediums that I that I. I've chosen to use like it, it varies a little bit, like um, the stenciling and wheat pasting, and doing a lot of like street art stuff. I, I ended up finding a collective called Visual Resistance, which uh, was a group that formed after the RNC happened here in New York in 2004, the Republican National Convention, and that was a, a coalescence of a lot of different organizing um, from. All different kinds of people, all different kinds of organizations around New York were just like super pissed that the Republicans were going to have their convention here. And um, there was a group of uh, NYU students that had been doing that. that had been doing it this uh, news, this school newspaper, and they they were really interested in like the street art stuff that was happening, and like and, the, and they made a whole. Um, poster booklet. They invited a bunch of artists to make designs, and they actually printed like a poster booklet called Our City, Our Walls, and then they, that, that could, could be, you know, it was all these, like, anti-Republican posters that they could put up, like, that people were we, were we pasting up, and I actually ended I up doing a bunch of that. And they, I saw those. so, after the RNC, the, they wanted to continue, continue working together, so the, we founded this collective, Digital Resistance, and we... You know, we were kind of we were working on a bunch of different stuff. There was like the community plan because that was around the time Bloomberg was trying to was really really getting the the waterfront develop, development in, in Brooklyn going, which we can all walk over there now and see those freaking towers. But then it was those the things were there. Towers, you mean? Yeah, they all on like Kent and stuff like that. Like oh, that whole area. But like it, so we did we did some we were, we did a lot of like props and. and made some banners for like protests as, as a as visual resistance like and we were find, just finding ways of like trying to use our graphic talents to to make to make objects for protests so um, and as as we um, were kind of looking for for new themes to work with the uh, 
we started, you know, I mean, we were all cyclists, and critical mass was the bike ride at the end of every month. Was had been going for years and years in New York, and it just had grown so much. But um, during the, the RNC, there was about like 8,000 cyclists on the street. The, the mayor didn't care for that much, and actually like really, really, at, at that ride, and also at the, the ones following that, just like really started pummeling cyclists in the city, and just like arresting people at the critical mass, but also like criminalizing cycling. So we were like, well, what do we do? We should start making images around that are, that are positive for cycling. We'll stencil on the bridges, we'll weep pick them up. And then there was, we started noticing there was a, a handful of people that were getting hit by automobiles. Cyclists were like getting killed. So that same group, we were like trying to figure out how to, I mean, it was how to respond to this because as artists we're like, well, how can we make this visible? And um, we decided to do a, a memorial, which became the, the ghost bikes. Yeah. So we, wow. we, we painted the, these white bikes and made a plaque. Of so every time where I see those white bikes, yeah. it's because of you guys. Because he printed yeah. them. What? Because we started it. Yeah, and I. Dude. So, and that's pretty hard. So, like, where I actually get. And that's that crazy the ink, too. You that should you just can't have this. Too, that's <laughs> no, really. You should just have this on your business card. <laughs> I started Ghost Bikes. Co founder. <laughs> Founder of Ghost Bikes ID. I mean, it's, it is amazing, and we're laughing, but it's a sad thing when it happens. But, and you well, obviously, you got you obviously that. went amazing. really uh, into that, but I mean, this is, I feel like, don't care to get into politics, especially not on this podcast, but. Um, I already did, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I yeah, want to. Because, because I think an artist and an. Uh, oh, you're being really deep into it and really doing a lot of things consciously and not just... I do a lot of self-expression and just do my dreams and then I don't even know what the fuck it is, but it's someone would like, Oh my God! How did you know? <clears throat> and it happened to me, someone telling me, I'm selling in a market in Brooklyn, someone sees my shirt and says, Dude, I had this dream. And I'm like, Oh really? Because I made it from my dream. <laughs> did you? Did you? Did your dream? And, and then we were talking about it. And it's insane. How can you connect? But I had no, you know, I didn't want to change. Where I wanted to change the world, be like everybody should wear my stuff like that. But that's just very selfish. But do you think this is what I'm trying to go on my elbow to get here? Because I think it's important to question everything. <clears throat> do you think there's a way when? Uh, Someone can belong to a political party that represents something. But this is all made off of individuals, just you and I. Can it be that some people just misled, belong to the party, and they're not evil, they're not fundraisers, they're not... not what I'm trying to say, do you think there are really cool people? Is it possible to be really nice, cool guys in every political party as well as assholes in you know every group and every team, every... In every ten, there's always one guy who's just like, come on, get it together. You know what I mean? Like, is it possible there's a bunch of good guys in every political party? Besides oh, you I doing think... like that convention against the one specific target and subject and idea, do you believe... I mean, that's maybe someone Republican listening to this, and I'm wondering, if he doesn't go or she doesn't go, what the fuck, man? Then you would be like, this is, you know, I can totally see that you're a nice guy. Maybe you believe in something that doesn't work or something. Do you believe that could be a cool Republican who actually... I think there's... I mean, I, that's... Well, that's kind of why I have the radical politics that I do have, is that I feel like that humans all have the potential to be good. We all have the potential to be really bad, which is one of oh, the reasons why I, I don't really... Why, I mean, if I'm going to choose a label, I call myself an anarchist. But that's because, I mean, I, I've seen how police can abuse their power. So, I, I mean, I'm not interested in giving... Anybody that much power, right? You're not and interested in real energy when everybody's just not going chaos, nuts. No. Yeah, I want like I want there to be organization, and I want I I want to I want to live in a world that that actually allows people to 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 show those good sides because I do feel like people have such incredible. Everybody does. I don't care. Like yeah, I don't care what you identify with, like, like what you want to label yourself as politically, or I mean, I really don't fucking have some really hatred for racism and homophobia and well, that's okay. because like if people are going to like put, you put you people, in a, normally that's normal <laughs> well, you're right? fine right? you're good 
Yeah. So it's like, I mean, and I feel like... I'm weird about that. So I don't... So no matter what category people fall into or, or people are going to put you into socially, like, everybody has the potential to be good, and we are. Unless you're, like, some a psychopath and a misanthrope, like, everybody has a friend that they're going to be nice to. It's like, oh, so, yeah. so you should be able it's to do misanthrope. Everyone. Somebody hates I o- I can't know that. I, I, I always... You might be I always, I always. <laughs> my name is Matthew J. Lane, and I'm a listen bro. I no, I always think about that. See, wh- whoever you would bring up in history or politics or whatever, they had a family, and they were kids at some point, and there were some kissing and hugging and loving. You have to know everybody loves their own, and then the problem is once we start making teams, my team is better than your team, or just different, yeah. or why are you not this team? Yeah, if I have a bad exactly. day. Which could be like, what if I don't exercise, if I don't work, it's not until I'm just sitting at home and I'm starting not to care about so much others and trying to just relax, laid back, which I don't think we're designed to do, then it's starting to be like, why not me? Why is that? Why is he? Now he's doing better. This is all teams. This is all yeah. pointing, not liking the other person for my own uh, deficiency or something like that. And I, I agree, I think the slingshot Definitely sometimes goes out of one way and then there's going to be another group who represents, no, 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 no. You can't just go out to the, any direction so far and not to have a mirror of that showing up on the other side, which we always see with, you know, even politics or anything else. But, uh, yeah. And uh, what do you, let's say, someone wants to come to New York, they love New York. They're like, New York City is in every movie. I love New York. I'm in this small town. I don't care. This is my New Year's resolution. I want to come to New York. I want to be one of those artists. If someone wants to start it right now and just have an idea, let's say, kind of into it, went to art school or something, have some affinity to it, into it. What do you think? What, what would be your advice or what to look at for? What's the sim- or if you have any, maybe, maybe not. Or maybe you can tell them don't come. Or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what would you say to somebody? Yeah. Write you an email or a letter today, like, oh my God, I love your work. I yeah. want to be just like so you. Buy, I'm starting out. Buy ticket. I mean, buy the ticket. Don't take, buy take. that ticket. That rock. <laughs> don't buy it. Kevin. And we're all here, and then that would be very selfish to say to someone, don't go through the hardships I went, but be like, if you would meet the 20 year old yourself comes to New York City with your brain now, what would you tell this person with your experience? You have a minute. Yeah. Oh, I only have a minute? Shit. No, what I... Yeah, the, I, I guess, I mean, the funny thing is, like, because I grew up in a small town outside of New York. I had access to New York, and I never thought in my whole life I, that I'd move to the city. And it's definitely taken me, you know, it, it took me a couple of years of, of, I was a travel punk and a bum, and I didn't have a job for so many years, but I would come and stay, like, and just stay at people's houses in Manhattan, and... I lived in the Bronx, I was squatting in the Bronx for a little while, and um, so my trajectory is a little bit different because I was, I, I came to New York, well, like a lot of people, with nothing, <laughs> and yeah, you, you, a couch. I mean, you have to, you have to cultivate community, and so if I was to give somebody advice that's like, I want to go to New York, um, you know, you don't, I, I see people that come to New York that, for the financial aspect of things, like who come here, because a lot of people come here like, I'm gonna fucking make a shitload of money and it's career. Like, yeah. That's cool. And then do you hear a lot of people that are like here for their careers and they fucking hate their lives because they don't have any friends. Because their friends are from work and they don't have any other affiliation with those people other than the fact they have to see them at work. And then they go out and have drinks with them, but they, those people suck. I mean not I'm just saying like the people have the experience suck. where yeah, they're like could suck. I don't I don't I don't bond with these people. So for people that are coming to New York, I feel like you gotta, it, you, you gotta either have it find, find it in. Find your circle. Yeah, you gotta find, you find come it. here. We all know people that live here. Find your circle. Exactly, and it's like, if I, I most mean, people I'm, that I know that come to New York, and me, and a lot of people who just basically go go to New York with nothing, no fucking job, nothing. I mean, obviously you're supposed to do it that way, but like, just couch surf for three months or two months with somebody who's cool, and just make it happen. Well, yeah. So that's the thing. It's like you. Don't Scary. feel like you have to like yeah. Don't feel like you have to have five thousand dollars and you move to New York and get an apartment. It's like you got to cultivate a community here. So 
for yeah, for me, I per my trajectory was that that I yeah I had ended up building up a network of friends, and because of my politics and because of my philosophy, I would say I, did, I wasn't working much, but I, and I kind of got in more with the freaks because that's also to me historically New York was where all the freaks went. So I I was. I used to come visit New York and go Maybe to you, shows and other stuff. Me. But. <laughs> You're like the freaks. <laughs> no, but it's so true. I almost believe you got here where you got because you started out all right. You came to New York and then you're like, all right. I think we all realize that at some point. Almost everybody comes here, especially a young man, come, comes here with some sort of idea or falls apart. And they're like, all right, this is the city, this is the easiest to be lonely mm -hmm. in New York City. So I always say, if you, if you want to come to New York, you have to love yourself as much, or you have to acknowledge at some point you're going to have to face yourself, look into the mirror and be like, I have to fucking do this because it's hard. And once you go through all this hard shit, it's, 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 it's not going to... You're not gonna meet somebody who's like, all right, let, let me let me uh, do the hard work for you, and it's done. This is There's one definitely of the, parts that suck. Yeah, they do that, suck. I but think then it's the thing really, is, really like, hard. just the energy of New York is fucking goddamn amazing. I mean, exactly. Like you walk down the street, to me, it's inspiring. The, the street art, the graffiti, <clears> the fucking even just like you sit down at like somewhere, getting a coffee, drinking a Budweiser at the bar, and like there's a person next to you, and you can even strike up a conversation and be like, what's up? And like people, to me, that's one thing that made me want to move here after living in Boston. Because Boston, like people that don't want anything to do with anybody else. For me, and where I, you know, was hanging out, and like I came here, and I would like just talking to the people who just rad, you know, and like and it obviously in the inspiration and the energy, the fucking energy in the air in this town is goddamn amazing. But New York City, it, it can be overstimulating. New York City being like uh, a city of immigrants. I mean, is that I don't know how many percent seventy. Or more, yeah, no not people who were born and raised. So almost everybody has a story. I was in this town and I wanted to come to New York and then see what happens. But I'm saying if you make it, uh, I hate to quote Jay Z, but if you make it in New York, you can make it everywhere. Like once you go through that hard ship to like finding your friends, this place is so easy to be lonely. No one gives a fuck. You fall on the street, might as well just kill yourself. No one's gonna care. A lot of people won't. Most people will step over you because they have to do their thing and it's so insane. So many people on top of each other living in these little buildings when you can, you know, on the other side of the wall, a person you don't know shitting. And it's not like this in a lot of places in America or in the world. Yeah. So once you go through all this and then train yourself, be like, I can't wake up again at five and then just go through the community and the train is not coming, there's assholes on the train. And then whatever you go through, which you don't go through in a lot of places, once you reach your adulthood and have a job and you can pay your bills and you went through like so much training that you'll you you'll do your job especially if it's a job like diy so you start for yourself you make as much as you work you already have that discipline and experience you went through just to sort of stay alive at that point that you can inject it to your work so there's so many amazing artists in new york i truly believe it has to do with it's cold, you have to dress up, we have like 59 degrees in the morning, 9 at night. And <laughs> yeah. This is not necessarily, you know, just hanging out on the beach all day. Yeah, 54 so, degrees so this so afternoon, 4 degrees in about an hour. Yeah. Welcome to New York City. And that's, I do love New York because of those extremes. And yeah, it's, I mean, I, I live in, the, it, it's my, it's the climate for, for my genetics, I guess. But like, I, I do like the extremes of it because... I think it, it does push, it pushes the people in this town, but, like, because you have, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be here, you gotta put up with those extremes, you gotta put up with, like, these nasty cold-ass winters with that, the, nobody's gonna put salt on the sidewalk, so you might fucking fall and break your neck. Yep. And then in, the, in August, if you're still here, it's like, you're gonna be, like, sweating balls in your apartment, and you don't got air conditioning or something, and it's like, it's like, those those extremes, I feel or like your they make freeze in your <laughs> fucking bathroom when you go home and they make you sleep at two in the morning. People that are like are well rounded in the sense like they're not they yeah, they're not just chilling on the beach and get to relax all the time. Um, but there's, I there's lost the West Coast. By the way, if, I do if too. Anybody would think that. Too. That's what I'm saying. I'm just saying if I went to any place after I lived here for a couple of years, 
it seems so much easier to get on trains and subways because this was kind of difficult to learn first and once you got through that it's I'm not saying it's a piece of cake but you're gonna see probably a less complex less complicated system with people with more patience and yeah. stuff like that yeah it's different and it, that's I do appreciate leaving New York and realizing that like oh yeah you can kind of chill out it's different it's different it's nice but it's also like well I can't wait to get back to New York you know yeah, exactly. same with me. I'm from Europe, and then that was a big change in of continents. And then first I came to the West Coast, and I was there for a little bit. Then I came to the East Coast, and I hated it. And now every time I leave, for after two days, I'm like, oh, man, the train. Where's the train? I missed the train. Yeah, yeah it's... I, yeah. What you were saying, just about making it in New York, that my first... so. I was in and out of town for a bunch of years. Then 2004, I decided to move to Brooklyn. And for work, I ended up doing an after-school gig, and, like teaching kids art and doing projects with them and stuff. And, and um, you know, it was like, I think it was maybe 15 bucks an hour, but it was only like three hours a day. It was five days a week. So I, I wasn't making much money at all. But at the end of the year, after like that end of that school year, I, or like the first you know, taxable year or something. I look at what I made and I was like, dude, I made like, I only made like $8,000 or something that whole year. And I managed to save like three of it. And nice. I was like, if I can live in freaking Brooklyn and only make this much money and was able to save a bunch of it, I was like, I could do anything. I felt like a superhero. I was like, I can live in any town in this freaking country. <laughs> I bet you didn't gain weight. <laughs> well, yeah, that's you didn't get fat. I, I used, I used to, and I, yeah, I, I used to scavenge and, uh, and dumpster dive a lot of food and stuff like that because of all the excess in this town. All the health food stores would be thrown away perfectly with food. Me and my friends would go and, and dumpster food and make dinners and stuff. So yeah. I, th I think the best advice someone's trying to come to New York or Brooklyn and, and try to do this artist life is, I think it's going to be just hard, but it's worth if you can go through it. If you can't, it's fine. It's not for everybody, but if you go through it, it is very different and special. I have no, it's not even I have no it's advice. An adventure. At all. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. You don't think it's fucking hard? Enough? I have no advice on that category. I say buy that ticket or don't buy that ticket. Yeah, that's your advice. Where are we at? Nice. So, what are you looking? For? We got a lot of stuff there. That's awesome, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you so much for doing the podcast. Stoked. Stoked. And then why don't you uh, tell us where people can find your art? <laughs> only talk about my art. <laughs> where can they find you? Yeah, like your websites and like your prints on those scenes, dude. Yeah, like, just plug. Is that a website or? Yeah, make so. Rad posters. Well, jeez. Any uh, openings happening, or will you be here in the opening? People can meet you and the. Yeah, Bushwick like I'm Labs. here at the Bushwick Print Lab. Um, I was, I kind of lost my steady gig, so I'm gonna actually try and be screen printing more. Um, I sell my artwork through Just Seeds at JustSeeds.org, which is an artist-run cooperative. Um, I was trying to find a way, I should mention this a little bit, is that Just Seeds is a project that we um, that we started as printmakers to as an outlet and distrib distribution me mechanism for our political prints because we're not we're not like the, it's not so easy for us to like go into galleries because of the nature of our work is like it's not very sellable. <laughs> it's yeah. not very sellable for, for high value and stuff. And the, the kind of work that we are doing is like, we're making large multiples that we can actually distribute to as many people as possible. So, um, and we do a lot of different portfolio projects, so prints. Um, but you can order all that online. Yeah, and it's you all, it all, it's all through the store. And you, yeah, can, so. you can check out the projects. We have a, a, a blog that's all unique content. Like each, we got, so there's 25 artists in the group. So, if, if like, any number of those people are contributing stuff to the blogs, there's always re always really cool stuff to check out and read on there. Um, and yeah, we've got a web store, so there's always new stuff that's coming up. Like that, each artist pretty much makes their own work in their studios because they're for all around the country, we're in like 12 different cities. So each artist cool. makes their work and sends it sends it to the to our headquarters where it's all mailed mailed out. So you can look at my stuff on JustSeeds.org. My name's Kevin Kaplicki, and you can buy my work and Part of that money that you spend on the website will go to me, and the other part will go to the cooperative, so we can keep on making new work and keep on supporting each other. So sounds good. Yeah. Matt, do you have something to promote? 
No, no. You're really. going to be at the Art Lab four year anniversary? Um, yeah, of course. We'll be here for the anniversary. We got a lot of shirts. I got tons of stuff. I'll probably put, to hang some shirts up. See what I'm saying? He's like, I got none. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, I'll just hang some spring, stuff out. 2014, 2014 <laughs> spring. It's going to go down. Like, I got, I got the. I'll show you. Yeah, and it's then, top secret enough. And then, uh, yeah, Ray will read uh, the advertising or whatever is happening for the lab. And they definitely put that on there. That's a good idea. And then, uh, I think I'm gonna do a lot of markets this year, but not set yet. And I'll try. Really? To, I, I'll try to come by. Are you gonna do like artists of fleas and stuff? Uh, I don't know. What, what market? I'm eyeing a couple of things and That's then I'll, I'll hop around. But uh, I was thinking I, I want to get back to my uh, 2006, seven when I was just starting and getting into a couple of years, and when I, you know, my things went up on the walls and construction. Just go on Bedford, bring a table, and do it. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll, well, I don't know if I'll thing. do that, but I'll, I, 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 I want to try a bunch of things. I really like a couple of them. I really like a night bazaar and. I've been told that sounds like something could could work for me. I've heard pro and con, and who knows? It's not. I, if I you did try the you do really well. We'll see. See what happens. But that's just you know, there's a bunch of options, or maybe not. I don't know. But I'm thinking about getting out there, like physically, because it's very different. I did last year. I basically just did online only. So. It's time to get back out there. This is just give you again another perspective. I'm getting older and like, you know, the audience is still um, a different crowd and I'm just getting older and older. It's really cool to see what do I have to offer for the folks. You know, I'm going to go home tonight and watch some Dex Dexter. When I'm this old. I've got a couple episodes left. <laughs> or that. Oh, i got something else. Um, the, I'll be tabling for the other project, the Interference Archive, at... Um, the Neutral Milk Hotel shows at BAM, so people can come and get some of the totes that I got Damn. in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> nice. Where is my ticket, bro? <laughs> Which, you, guys about <laughs> you, you guys talk about it. You guys talk about it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, thank you so much. And if for you need posters this. printed, get in touch with me. <laughs> there you go. Kevin at justseeds.org. So. There you go. And thanks for Kevin, and hopefully uh, this will come around, and maybe in a little bit we'll, we'll have you on again. Yeah, and, please. And hopefully some people will listen to this. Cool. Thanks so much.